This podcast is about introducing our fans to the animals, plants, and other products that we work with at Josh's Frogs. It's an opportunity to paint a picture of our hobby that is refreshing. We want you guys to be successful with the animals that you're keeping, and we want our hobby to grow ethically and sustainably into the future. Welcome to the Josh's Frogs podcast. I got Austin here. We're going to talk about some uh, tree frog species. But before we do that, I just want to do a commercial for Josh's Frogs, the sponsor of the Josh's Frogs podcast. Uh, we're your one-stop shop uh, for all your reptile and amphibian needs. We carry everything that you need to take care of those animals. So from feeder insects, bioactive supplies, to reptile lighting, to caging, all that kind of stuff, we uh, supply all that and we can get everything all in one box uh, to your location so you can take care of those animals on top of that we offer uh, industry leading uh, live arrival guarantee on not only our animals but our insects as well um, so we'll take care of you make sure that you're successful that way um, we also have a uh, tons of blog articles uh, to give you the information that you need and a bunch of videos and all that kind of stuff we want you to be successful with the animals you keep so we've got all that stuff so check us out joshesfrogs.com um, and then without further ado, this is Austin. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, some uh, red eyes, black eyes, um, and some lemurs as well, too. So, um, Austin, you've, this is your second episode um, on the podcast. Yeah. Um, but if, if somebody hasn't listened to the first episode, tell me a little bit about how you came to Josh's Frogs and what is it that you actually do here. So I started at Josh's Frogs um, almost immediately out of college. I think it had been like less than two weeks <laughs> uh graduated from msu with a degree in zoology and started the day after christmas in 2012 <laughs> so i've been here a while um i'm currently the curator of tree frogs and toads and all other basically not dart frog amphibians um and yeah we have quite a large collection of agalichnis, which includes the red eyes, black eyes, lemur tree frogs, and also the uh, dachnicolor, which are the Mexican leaf frogs. Um, yeah. Cool. So pretend our, our uncles or aunts are listening to the podcast. They don't know anything about keeping these types of animals. Mm -hmm. What are some of the tasks that you're doing and what are the tasks that your team's doing on a daily, weekly basis? It's a lot of cleaning up poop. Um <laughs> We feed these frogs anywhere from three times a week to down to two times a week when they're adults. Um, so the adults get cleaned a little bit less frequently than the babies, but we're cleaning babies three times a week, um, scraping poop off of glass and disinfecting um, with our Reptisan that we have. Um, and then, again, the babies get fed three times a week, and so they're pooping at least that much uh, <laughs> and sometimes more often than yep. that so um it's just a lot of cleaning and the baby's main job is just to grow so that they can be large enough to be sent out to our customers cool cool all right we're going to talk about that group of uh frogs can you can you kind of compare and contrast like what are the differences uh among them so most of them are going to be green I think all of them are green, actually. So they are Phylomedusine, which is in the same family as the frogs we talked about last time, the giant waxy monkey frogs. Um, phylo means leaf. And so that's kind of what their whole game plan is. In the wild, they're going to be hanging out on leaves, and they're going to be camouflaged on those leaves they do experience color change at night to kind of reflect that they turn almost like a dark purple color um and it allows them to move around with less visibility to predators um and they also most of them have some sort of defense mechanism in their skin so they'll secrete to us it's mostly just an odor like if you pick up a red-eyed tree frog and it's not expecting it and you smell your hand afterwards it's gonna have an odor to it um it's very unique so i can't really compare it to anything um but i will say you know it when you smell it <laughs> that's awesome um but if i had to guess i've never done it it would probably taste bad if i also like had got those secretions into my mouth um so they're not completely defenseless outside of just trying to be as hidden as possible yeah. um but all of the frogs in this uh genus the agalichnis are um, 
when they fall asleep, they tuck in their arms and legs really tight to their bodies and their the sides of their fingers that are still exposed and their legs are the same color as their the rest of their body. So it's pretty uniform across the board with those this species like they have a lot of bright colors hidden between their legs and when they're awake you can see that um so red-eyed tree frogs have this bright blue color um and bright orange on their feet um which can also be startling to uh predators yeah uh, black-eyed tree frogs are fairly bright yellow on their um bright yellow and orange um lemur tree frogs have really really white eyes when they open them up it's really striking to see them um so yeah, cool. it's a lot of hiding out in the wild and trying to eat as much food as possible. <laughs> now talk a little bit about size difference or body structure differences between those three guys. So the biggest difference for the ones that we work with are the lemur tree frogs. Uh, they didn't used to be in Agalichnus when I first started working here. They were in um, a genus that I think has been retired. They were in Hylomantis um, with some other really slender and smaller tree frogs. Uh, big female lemur tree frog is going to be like just hitting that two inch mark. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's kind of like the minimum size of a male red eyed tree frog. Wow. Um, females are going to be about three for red eyed tree frogs and then black eyed tree frogs. Females get up to like two and a half or three and a half, three and three quarter inch. Um, they're probably one of the more bulky of the agalicness that we're working with. Um, and the Dacna color as well. Um, but we don't have quite as many, of those. Um, mm -hmm. but the, the Dachnicolor are a really, really bulky species. Um, and they love it to be really hot. They're also a weird one because <laughs> they'll actually go up and bask. Um, and none of the other ones really like that much heat. They're definitely more in the shaded regions in when they're up in the trees. Um, but yeah, lemur tree frogs are going back to them. Smallest of the ones that we're working with and a, the most slender, like mm -hmm. a, a good healthy weight lemur tree frog looks emaciated compared to your typical red eye or black eyed tree frog. So if people are working with them, they definitely need to keep that in mind that they're not skinny or anything. That's just how they look. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now you talked a little bit about caging being a little bit different, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, for basking. How would you describe caging differences among them? Like, is it pretty uniform on, on how you should keep them with the exception of the, the basking? Yeah, we prefer to do just your standard 18, 18, 24, so you get the extra height because they're tree frogs. Um, we currently are keeping our lemur tree frogs over water, which is unique to them. We don't keep any of the other uh, leaf frogs on water. Um, and that's just to help to facilitate their breeding style. They kind of just go whenever they feel like it, and they'll lay their eggs on the undersides of leaves. Um, for red eyes, black eyes, and the Mexican leaf frogs, we have to put them in rain chambers. Um, and for the Mexican leaf frogs, we've found that cycling them a bit um, with a drier, cooler period, and then warming them up and keeping them really wet has helped to uh, be a little bit more successful with those guys. Um, but yeah, the 181824 XO Zoomed, whatever your favorite brand of uh, enclosure is, um, and then we do bioactive for most of our stuff. Um, that's like the red eyes and the black eyes and the Dacna color. They have just, it's basically a dart frog enclosure. Mm -hmm. So your false bottom substrate barrier, ABG or your preferred bioactive substrate, and then cover it in sphagnum and leaf litter, um, live plants. They really like the mother-in-law's tongue or the snake plants yeah. to hang out on. Very sturdy, can hold the, the yep. weight of those guys. Um, you talked, a, <clears throat> excuse me. You talked a little bit about breeding um, with those guys and how the lemurs are are doing it inside the uh, the normal enclosure, and then you're taking the other guys out into the rain chamber. Talk a little bit about frequency. Are the lemurs breeding more frequently than some of the other ones? How does that work? So, uh, they're fairly seasonal. Um, ours just picked back up uh, breeding uh, within the past couple of months. Um, and so it usually coincides with the weather that's happening outside. Uh, you get these barometric pressure shifts, typically in Michigan, we have the fall time where it gets kind of rainy and windy mm -hmm. and throughout the winter, we get really, really big barometric pressure shifts. So we actually see probably similar to their rainy season down in South America. It kind of coincides with that. Um, but I don't think that the circadian rhythm of everything kind of syncs up in that same way. I think they would breed 
if our wet season was in the summer, they'd breed in the summer. Yeah. Um, but yeah, summertime is usually the least successful Mm -hmm. for us, um, with fall, winter and spring being pretty good. Um, so yeah, we get our rain chambers set up and you pick your pairs. Uh, usually we just go off of who looks the fattest. Um, but we do try to give them breaks of at least like two to three months between yeah. breeding so that it's not overdone. Yeah. Um, but we've also found that females will just dump eggs in the enclosure anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, like the past few weeks we've gone through, um, we had a really, really successful, um, late summer, early fall breeding period with our red eyes. And so we kind of stopped breeding them cause we have like 500 something currently yep. and we're like we don't really need that many more <laughs> but they're still dumping eggs in their enclosures and we're like i guess we can collect these and <laughs> set them up as tadpoles but it's not, we try to keep our males and females separate so we have some of our holdbacks that we haven't quite sexed out yet that yep. they're giving us fertilized eggs and we're like okay okay cool <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome when they do it and you're not doing any work for right. that yeah. uh talk a little bit about feeding is that um what are some things that are true about all of them when it comes to feeding what are some differences about feeding when it comes to those uh different so feeding is done on our schedule because that's when people are working monday wednesday friday is pretty typical and then on like Tuesday, Friday or Monday, Thursday for the adults. We're not really trying to um, make the adults like overweight or anything like that because it, it ultimately will shorten their lifespans. Yep. Um, and so we try to kind of keep that in check unless we're trying to breed a pair or a group of frogs. And then you kind of power feed them to get the females ready and their energy levels up. Uh, so that they're ready to expend a lot of energy in producing and laying eggs. Um, males don't really need that, but they kind of get the same treatment just mm-hmm. as a general rule. You kind of just give everybody the same amount of food so yep. it's not too confusing. Um, with babies, like I had said, we do three times a week just for growth rates, um, and they're eating everything, and they're not getting overweight. So um, they're putting most of the energy that they're consuming into just growth. Um, the main difference with sizing, um, kind of correlates with the sizing of the individual animals. We give lemur tree frogs, um, eighth inch crickets when they first come out of the water. And then, um, they cap out at quarter inch crickets. They can't really take half inch, um, super well. The males would struggle with it. Um, and the females will take the quarters just fine, even though they probably could take a half inch. Mm -hmm. Um, most of them come out of the water at the same size. So the eighth inch is kind of their standard starting size. And then once they start eating quarter inch crickets, that's usually around the same time that we're um, listing them for sale um, because they've hit that point where they're large enough to do well in shipping. Cool. Cool. Now you talked a little bit about size difference um, among the different species and how that impacts uh, feeding. So you're, some of the lemurs, like what's the biggest cricket that they're going to eat um, when they're fully grown? Uh, so with lemurs, they're just a quarter inch cricket. That's kind of where we cap them. Uh, red eyes, females can take three quarter inch or large. Um, I don't really see that much difference between the two, um, at least in what we're feeding. Um, I prefer the three quarter inch to work with just because they're a bit quieter. Mm-hmm. Um, and then... The black-eyed tree frogs, all of them are for sure able to eat three-quarter inch. The dachna color, all of them can eat three-quarter inch crickets and even some like half-inch dubia roaches um, on occasion. Cool. Cool. Now, I know when uh, people are keeping uh, some of these nocturnal frogs, there's always this concern of like, I'm not sure if they're eating or not. Like, what are some things to watch for? Or, or how do you know if they actually are eating versus they're not eating? And what, what are some ways to kind of alleviate some fears? But also, when do you know when, hey, there's an issue that's mm-hmm. happening? So when people first get a frog, I like to recommend just like keeping them on paper towel. So you basically remove all of the bells and whistles of things, crickets getting lost in backgrounds and things like that. Um, And so it's just you're meeting their humidity and temperature requirements at that point. And it allows them to kind of acclimate. You get an idea of their behaviors, how much they're eating Mm -hmm. uh, and things like that. So you sprinkle in like three to four crickets per frog into the enclosure that has the damp paper towel in there. And you count the crickets in the morning. And if they ate them, 
the crickets won't be there. Mm -hmm. um, usually they're in glass enclosures or you can even use things like sterilite latch boxes if, as just like a temporary quarantine type of thing. Um, and yeah, the most important part is just adding enough water to the paper towel yeah. and so that they don't accidentally dry out. Um, most of those latch boxes, unless they are advertised as like airtight, are fine to have <laughs> some frogs in for a couple of days or a week. Um, and then you can reuse it and put shoes in it or something yep. under your bed. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, talk a little bit about handling the frogs uh, and the species. Like how, how often should you be doing? What should you be doing when you're doing that? So for lemurs and red eyes, they hate it. They are very, very <laughs> flighty, and they don't tolerate being handled very well. Uh, usually you do have to restrain them more than a black-eyed tree frog or the Mexican leaf frogs. Um, I think black-eyed tree frogs don't really care that much. Um, when I grabbed the female that's sitting behind me, uh, which you can't see because this is a podcast, um, <laughs> and she fell asleep on my hand while I was moving her around to try to find something to place her on so that she would just fall asleep. Cause I, I hedged my bets and I was like, the black eyed tree frog would be the one that's just going to be the most <laughs> chill for sitting around and listening uh, to us talk about her. Yep. Um, and so, yeah, black eyed tree frogs seem to be totally fine with handling. You always want to wear gloves. Um, cause we have oils and things on our hands that can be kind of detrimental to the skin of a frog. Um, I always say that they're basically just one big mucous membrane, like the inside of your mouth or your eyelid. Mm. And so anything that you are putting on them, if their skin is able to absorb it, it will. Yeah. So. Cool. Cool. Um, talk a little bit about captive bred versus wild caught. Like what's available in the hobby, captive bred, what's available, uh, wild caught, and mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that. Um, so red eyes and black eyes and lemur tree frogs if you're looking you should be able to find them captive bred i have not seen black eyed tree frogs available um wild caught uh for quite a while mm -hmm. uh, so i think most of the ones that you would be able to purchase um from most people would be captive bred uh there's not as many people working with them as there are red-eyed tree frogs um red-eyed tree frogs though are a really really tough one i would say if you're getting an animal that's an adult and you haven't spoken to the person that you're buying the frog from of extensively about like if they bred them themselves uh and even then uh some people will say that they're captive bred they might not know themselves mm -hmm. they might just assume that it is um but an um, overwhelming majority of red-eyed tree frogs that are available to be purchased by people are going to be wild caught. Um, I think they they were added to the CITES list like in the early 2010s, the whole genus of Agalechnus. And when they started actually counting the amount of animals that were leaving countries, it's kind of insane. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say years and years ago, you had mentioned that it was almost a hundred thousand i went and i looked and i verified it was almost a hundred thousand red-eyed tree frogs leaving yeah. just the country of nicaragua yeah. over the course of like three years which is insane yep. that's so many red-eyed tree frogs um and so there's a lot of that that is still happening yep. you're still able to get wild caught red-eyed tree frogs um they tend to be a little bit more vibrant mm -hmm. um when they're wild caught. So that's something that you could look for. Uh, they're more of like an almost iridescent green than uh, more of the, uh, it's kind of like a muted green. It's still, they're beautiful. Yeah. Um, but that's something that you could look for um, when you're shopping, like if you're at a trade show, uh, if it looks really iridescent and it's an adult, most likely it's probably something that was wild caught. Um, I know our big thing uh, is everything being captive bred. Um, we do work with adult red-eyed tree frogs that were wild caught. Um, we get them in occasionally just to kind of like bolster our bloodlines yep. uh, so that we're not inbreeding siblings together mm -hmm. constantly because yep. uh, that's not healthy f for the long term of keeping these animals yep. in captivity. Um, but there's also there's so many things with the wild caught red eyes that uh, you have to be watching out for. You have the possibility of parasites that... Uh, you're going to have to deworm them. Um, the 
biggest issue that we run into though is ronavirus Mm -hmm. um which if people don't know what ronavirus is it's the worst um it's basically a hemorrhagic virus for frogs and fish and turtles um you can pass it along to other pets um it's really really bad once it sets in um like i mentioned the red-eyed tree frogs and all frogs basically a mucous membrane and so the cells just kind of just start breaking down on their skin and they start bleeding out and it's really really sad um usually the things in the wild will have it and as long as they're not being super stressed out Mm -hmm. um nothing bad happens uh but if somebody's going out and catching these things and putting them in a box and then shipping them across uh international borders and stuff that kind of can trigger um a stress response in the frog and then the ronavirus kind of just blows up in their body and it's it's really sad it's uh something that's incurable so we can't even really treat anything um yeah so yeah. i um i often see on forums where people will say hey my my red eye seems to have these sores on its back mm-hmm. um and then people will recommend treating it with um, with some other over-the-counter and or uh, prescription type medicine to, to, to mm-hmm. deal with the, um, the the lesions and whatnot that are on that uh, frog's uh, side. And I'm, I'm always concerned about like, hey, you know, you're, you're treating that animal um, for some of the symptoms that it has, but not treating the, the root cause of the disease. But can you talk a little bit about how Rana spreads and like what is the chances that you're going to get the rana from that frog that you just are treating to some of the other frogs in your collection? So the biggest thing that you can do is, again, wearing gloves when you're handling Mm -hmm. any amphibian just to keep them safe and to also keep any other animals that you're working with safe and changing gloves frequently. When we're going through and quarantining things that we suspect, um, which basically is all red-eyed tree frogs, any red-eyed tree frog that comes into our facility, we're just default, this could have rana, change your gloves between every single tank Mm -hmm. um we also use a really really strong viricide when cleaning uh to make sure that we're not transferring anything around um as a personal person that is maybe just having it as a pet you probably don't need to go that far with things um but definitely changing gloves it's a spread by contact so if you're handling a red-eyed tree frog that's infected or any frog that's infected and then go and immediately handle something else without washing your hands or without changing your gloves it's a very very good chance that you are transferring that to that other animal and as i said it can infect fish um it needs a wet place to survive as well so usually full desiccation will get rid of all of the virus um but it does the same thing in fish and reptiles as it does in frogs. Um, it's not really something that we have in North America too much, yeah. uh, at least in the northern part. That does kind of creep up into the south a bit. Um, a lot of times you'll it'll pop up in like the the bullfrog farms and things yep. like that, where they're doing it for more of a food yeah. <laughs> production type of thing. Yep. Um, but yeah, it. I was going through and I just recently reading about ronavirus and it was affecting basically every single organ system in the entire body. Mm -hmm. Um, You can also treat it with heat, which works with some reptiles. Um, I went to a symposium where they were talking about ronavirus almost half a decade ago now, but they had a (laughs) box turtle at a zoo that had ronavirus and they kept it outside in like their barn Mm -hmm. enclosure at the children's zoo section and it got to like over 100 degrees inside the barn and then they tested it for ronavirus and it was it didn't have anymore wow (laughs) so like they they, you can do that with reptiles because they love heat frogs most of the time it you'll end up killing the frog if you try to pump up the (laughs) heat that much on them though um but yeah you just want to be very very careful um I don't let my employees touch frogs with the same pair of gloves if they aren't like in the same genus. Um, and if it's in quarantine, we are changing gloves just constantly. Yeah. Um, we also try to minimize the amount of frogs in one enclosure to minimize spread. If only one frog has it in a, an enclosure, um, it's only potentially infecting two other frogs um, at most. Yeah. And that's kind of just how 
we do our swab testing. You can swab three frogs at a time for each test uh, to see if anyone has ronavirus. Yeah, and ronavirus uh, testing is available to anybody. Anybody can swab their frogs. And yeah, get there are tests. multiple companies that uh, do genetic tests. It's basically they look at the DNA on yeah. the swab. Uh, ronavirus lives in the blood, and so if you ask these companies that's what they recommend getting is a blood sample but it's really difficult to get a blood sample on yeah. a frog that might only be like an inch long yeah um typically though if they have ronavirus and you just got them the frog will not be alive yeah by the time you get the results back mm -hmm. like you you see that it's got ronavirus and then it's gone yeah by the time you see the positive test result yeah yeah cool all right. Um, any other things that you want to say between all those uh, frog species that people should keep in mind if they're thinking about keeping some type of tree frogs? What, what are some things you'd say, hey, you know, lemurs, if this is true, you do black eyes, if this is true about how you're, you're wanting to set them up. But what are some things that you'd say to people? Um, if you are in a warmer climate and you don't have or you're trying to keep your energy costs low, <sighs> um, so it's a little bit warmer in your house. Yeah, probably the Mexican leaf frogs would be the one for you. Um, black eyes, red eyes, and lemurs are pretty much the same temperature, um, in the mid 70s. So all you really need would be like some fluorescent lighting over them, UV lighting. Um, that's going to generate enough heat to kind of bump it up just above room temperature. Um, and yeah, if it's basically all on personal preference, everybody seems to really, really like the red eyed tree frogs. They have green, orange, and blue on them. Um, they're a beautiful frog. Um, people that want a frog that might be a little bit more chill, though, I would probably recommend black-eyed tree frogs. Um, I really, really like them. Um, they are probably one of my favorite tree frogs to work with just because they're so handleable and they don't seem like they want nothing to do with you. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. And lemur tree frogs are really cool because they're critically endangered in the wild. Um, they were hit really hard by the chytrid fungus. Um, and they developed, the cool thing about them is they developed a bunch of uh, complex skin peptides that are actually antimicrobial and antifungal. And so a lot of the ones that are out in the wild are less susceptible to chytrid infection now. That's crazy. That's yeah. crazy. Um, we also do some conservation stuff with the lemurs. Yes, the lemur tree frogs are one of our permanent conservation uh, efforts that we're currently doing. Those guys and the all mantellas. Um, so every <clears throat> lemur tree frog that we sell, I believe we donate five dollars, and I cannot remember who we give that to. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's on our website. Yes, in our conservation. Um, section you can navigate to that and see all of our permanent conservation partners cool. um i remember the madagascar one but yeah. i can't remember who it is in i want to say it's costa rica yep so back. yeah yep 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 all right let's do some lightning round questions you got, oh you've already done these so uh this will be round two maybe we'll see if your answers have changed okay all right if money and space were no issue what's your dream pet it would still be the yellow spotted climbing toad just one female in a really cool enclosure, because I don't think my family would like the males being loud all the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Besides Josh's Frogs, what's another business that you uh, would love to give a shout out to? They're doing great products, great animals, somebody that you want to give. And... I believe I did auto top off last yep. time, but because we talked about disease and testing in this episode, I'm going to shout out Research Associates Labor Laboratories. Yep. Um, they're down in Allen, Texas. Yep. That's who we are preferred person to go and do all of our testing with. Um, if you buy a testing kit from Josh's Frogs, um, we are not test like giving you the DNA analysis or anything like that. They're doing all of that work. Um, it's fairly inexpensive just for your own peace of mind. Mm -hmm. um, and so we use them constantly mm -hmm. and have always had good experiences with them. Cool. Uh, what is your favorite animal or plant in the whole world? Okay. So my favorite animal would be a frog. So it's a Brazilian species, they're pumpkin toadlets. It's kind of just the, the whole genus. They're these tiny, stupid little things that are almost so small that they shouldn't exist. Um, they don't have fully fleshed out 
hands like they are missing many of their fingers a lot of them just kind of have like little spikes of one finger um they have uh, the same toxins that puffer fish do the tetrodotoxins so like if you eat one you your nervous system will shut down um <laughs> which is not good no but it's cool and then they also their skeleton will fl- fluoresce under black light Wow! So they're just—it's just a lot of stuff packed into this tiny little orange frog. That they also uh, have direct development. So they lay oh, eggs wow. and then they hatch out into just small, tiny little <laughs> things. That's cool. That's cool. Yeah. All right, you got an hour of free time. What are you doing? Oh man, probably playing with my kids. And nice. if my kids are busy, then maybe playing a video game that I have in a backlog. <laughs> nice, nice. All right, if you had a bunch of people listening to you and you could only tell them one thing, what's, what, what, what message would you like to remind people of or tell them something that, that you've learned? What would you like to tell the people? Hmm. I think I, was, I said be nice to people last time. But again, I'm going to do biosecurity and it's just change your gloves <laughs> when handling your frogs or if you're catching frogs outside wash your hands before touching another frog spray off your shoes with a five percent bleach solution after trekking around outside in the woods so you're not transferring things around that might be out there cool cool thanks a lot austin for giving us a a bunch of information and dropping some knowledge on us appreciate that uh thanks a lot guys have a good one Thank you for tuning in to today's episode. If you enjoy this content and want to stay up to date, make sure to like, subscribe, and follow us across social media. We always want to bring you the best content, so let us know what you think in the comments. And for all your reptile and amphibian needs, be sure to check us out at joshesfrogs.com. We have an amazing selection. Until next time, stay curious, stay froggy, and keep exploring.